Ja tava 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 To my life, let's roll up to be a single star in the sky. I hear you calling me. I wanna word you up into my life. Let's love up to make a single star in the sky. To you. I'm so in love with you I wanna word you up into my life Let's roll up to be A single star in the sky I need you to feel me I wanna word you up into my life Let's love up to make A single star in the sky to you
Hey guys, welcome to Three Cast. This is episode. What is this? Episode four? Episode five? Well, today I am with uh, a very special guest. It is my good friend Hren. He is uh, a very smart guy from um, uh, our our basket weaving group, and he he raises reptiles. He's a Buddhist. He translates. Um, you know, religious texts. He's a very interesting person. Uh, say hello. Hi, everybody. Um, I uh, am active in like the kind of East Coast basket weavers. Um, I uh, I'm hoping to organize some more events this year, but unfortunately, I just haven't gotten a chance lately. Mm-hmm. I write on the uh, Geed blog under the pseudonym uh, T Butters. Uh, so if you want to check out some of my writings, I'm on there. Um, and I generally classify myself as being like a, a national socialist and like general like NS adjacent person as well. Yeah, yeah. And you say adjacent because you're, you're Chinese. You're, um, I guess you would call yourself a East Asian nationalist, a Chinese nationalist. Yeah, I um, I find myself very inspired by the ideas of national socialism, but I think it's uh, important to kind of take them to like an almost international level, where that where the principles of the ideology are applicable to like every country and race to some extent. Yeah, yeah, I I certainly agree with that. Um, so we have pretty similar views on that, I guess. Um. Yeah, we we actually went to a party. We saw uh, the distributist, and um, you know he's with his wife, and he's a very smart person. Um, we talked about physics, and uh, you know he he was telling me all about stuff that he knows about physics. I was quite amazed. I said that to his um, his wife actually. Um, um, so that was cool to meet him. And we, yeah, I was really oh sorry. Yeah, oh, I'm sorry. Um, yeah, and then like after afterwards, me and Hren, we uh, we were on the couch. We were talking about philosophy and psychology for hours. Yeah, I uh, I actually like the distributist a lot. I've never listened to any of his stuff before. Um, that was actually the first time I've ever like encountered him. But he was very well put together, very uh, intelligent. He reminded me a lot of like a college professor. Yeah, yeah. Um, what do you call it? He. he... I don't know if he still does the distributist stuff, like as in like, because like distributism, it's like a, it's like um, it's a different economic model. It's it's similar to like socialism, but not quite. It's like it has more to do with distributing the means of production as as wide as possible. I don't know if he still does that, but he he basically is like uh, he does streams about like dissident right, NRX adjacent, you know, kind of stuff. Mm. Yeah, I'm not too familiar with that ideology, but to my understanding, it kind of came out of that like late 19th, early 20th century kind of like uh, uh, like milieu of like people coming up with like new and different like ideologies. And I think that was the Catholic Church's like official like economic policy. I think at the time. I'm, oh, I didn't even know correct that. Me of that. I, I knew yeah, it I think was that's associated the with. Yeah, I knew it was associated with like Catholicism, but I just didn't quite. I, I I understood why it was associated with it. I didn't know it was the official um, economic policy, though. It's pretty yeah. interesting. Yeah, it doesn't seem to get like a lot of play nowadays. Like a lot of people don't talk about it. Uh, and to be fair, I I know very little about it. But um, I think it yeah, came I, from. I think, uh, I think it came from G.K. Chesterton. I, uh, I, don't quote me on that. Yeah, I um, I think there is there's a lot of like kind of interesting like non-Marxist like socialist ideologies that um are from that time period that uh I think are definitely worth re-examining. For... Yeah, I um, a good book to read is um the National Bolshevist Manifesto by uh, Karl Otto Pytel. And now I I I'm not going to pretend that I understood everything that he said in the book. But what was really interesting about the book is that he was basically describing all of the factions of, like, the NSDAP, like, like stuff that was, like, adjacent to that. Like, there were, um, you know, liberal fascists, there were monarchist fascists, 
there were left nationalists of all all kinds. Um, it was a very uh, intellectually diverse period, and I guess uh, you know when when Hitler came to power, he homogenized all that. Hmm. I definitely think it's good. It's worth studying that because. It's important, I think, to kind of see all the different ways that socialism can appeal to people. Because I think right now, because of the economic situation that we see in the United States, socialistic like ideologies are almost mainstream. Like if you talk to like yeah. a random person under the age of like 30, generally speaking, they'll tell you like, yeah, something is very wrong with like the current um, economic capitalist economic system in America. Hmm. Yeah, I would agree with that. Um, you know, I got into like kind of like the Nasball stuff like years ago. I'm not really that interested in it anymore, but um you know, there's there's arguments to be made. There's certainly arguments to be made. I think it's kind of a one-sided discussion when people talk about communism or or they kind of they kind of do the same thing that they do with the Germans where they just relay a bunch of atrocity stories without giving both sides. So you know, like I know in the, um, there's a guy named um, Phil, or he, he used to go by some northern nationalist, and, um, you know, he pointed out a lot of interesting things about, um, you know, a lot of the atrocities, like he's pointing out how, you know, in the, in the Black Book of Communism, you know, they list people that like fell off of ladders or got into car accidents or stubbed their toe as being victims of communism. You know, so that's how they that's actually how they got that hundred million figures, just sort of by inflating the numbers. Yeah, I find it interesting because nobody um nobody really critically examines like the kill counts for uh especially like the USSR and um and like uh, the early PRC, um in the way that like we critically examine stuff like the Holocaust. Uh, yeah. And I, I I find like the idea just kind of at face value, for example, of like Mao kill or Stalin killing like twenty million people or whatever, just to be like at face value, kind of like, well, we should investigate that. You know what I mean? Yeah, yeah. And it's it's hard because it's like the Nas like the here's the problem with the Nasball position is that it's like first off, you're trying to rectify the reputation of one regime. You're trying to sell that to people. And then you're trying to, to rectify and sell the repu you know the reputation of another regime that and you're you're doing that with two regimes that are that are widely hated and then hate each other that you know people people on both sides of this this argument they hate each other they they you know they they wish each other death you know and it's 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 so silly that's that's um that's where I eventually realized I had to stop larping because I had to come with I had to come to terms with the fact that reviving 20th century radicalism is just really silly. Like you have to you have to forget about ideology and focus on policy and just like um brand it differently. Just just don't call it socialism. Don't call it um you know fascism. Don't 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 use that language. Okay, that that's all that stuff is from a war and nobody wants to deal with that. Yeah, my issue with a lot of um, a lot of very strict like ideological thinking is that a lot of these ideologies are built up on top of themselves. Like I, I think I think communism is a great example where communism has all of these different theories for explaining the world. Like for example, the whole like uh, dialectical materialism and like labor theory of value and like all that all that different stuff and all these different kind of like theoretical models for examining the world that just keep getting like built up on top of each other, they sort of just break down because ultimately they're not accurate, uh, they're not fully accurate and they're wedded to some degree to the time period that they arose in. Mm -hmm. And that causes them to become deeply out of sync with um, the modern kind of way of living, I feel. Yeah, and it's also like, um, you know, um, they're not very actionable. Like, you can't really do anything with an ideology other than try to convert other people. And so that's where, I, that's where my thinking is kind of, I've kind of moved away from ideology. And I've, I've been trying to look for stuff that's actionable. 
and not just like uh, going to rallies or whatever. I, I think everybody kind of agrees that's not a really good idea. I think everyone kind of agrees that, um, you know, like you have to move more in the direction of networking and money and basically elite theory, that kind of stuff. Um, but what I've been trying to do is like create some sort of ideology where it's just something that you can actually do in your free time, even if you're like, you know, you know, the chud cell flipping burgers at McDonald's, <laughs> you know, and, <laughs> and you hear you, you don't have a girlfriend, you, you have a crappy job. And, you know, I think that those are actually like the perfect people to get involved in um, something like yeah, that. Cause, cause they're sort of like this undifferentiated, like mass of like people that just like, they don't really have anything. And so they can be, they have a lot of like potential to do like to or to be used for like a lot of different stuff or to yeah. use themselves for a lot of stuff in the last like kind of like uh i don't know less like dehumanizing way of saying it but <laughs> i i feel like uh i was thinking a lot about this when the njp collapsed because i was pretty about pretty heavily invested in that organization to an extent and um i uh i think like my idea is that every time you do a political action there has to be a marginal benefit like for example take like the stickering campaigns that like the njp used to do those had no like marginal benefit like it doesn't like when you do like uh one stickering campaign doesn't equal like anything essentially it doesn't no i like, remember when i was in um identity europa and um i was in it for like i was only in it for like two weeks but I remember the first time I hung out with one of these guys, he was putting up stickers on like electrical boxes. And I was just thinking to myself, like, what, what's the point of this? And he was trying to explain to me that it was to make it look like they were really active. So it, it's, it's kind of like a cargo cult. And I understand why these people do it. It's like, literally, what else are you supposed to do from that, from that point of view? And, you know, I think that actually delves on another interesting point, which is the idea that projecting power is inherently good. And I actually think that's totally wrong, or I shouldn't say totally wrong. I think that's wrong in most circumstances. Uh, like when you think about militarily speaking, you don't always want to project power because that, that provokes a reaction from the other side. And that's not to say you should never do anything, but for example, like when you make it, make your group appear to be very active and a lot like more threatening than it really is, it provokes a response which your group might not yet be capable of um, responding to in turn. Mm -hmm. um, and, and anyways, yeah, no, I, I think that every single action has to have like a positive effect that's measurable and the idea being that you can then once you find those actions you can just keep doing them over and over again to keep generating that positive uh, result but the issue is if you have an action that doesn't clearly generate a positive result then you're essentially just like wasting your time like yeah. uh like protests or a lot like that exactly that too it's like it's very demoralizing as well yeah and um you know, the way I, th I think about it is that, like, if, if you want to, like, use a, a metaphor to understand our situation, it's kind of like we're trapped in a cage. Like, that's how badly we're beaten. We're just literally in a cage. But the thing is, like, when you're in a cage, you know, all hope is not necessarily lost, right? There is stuff that you can do when you're in a cage. It's just, it's just not the kind of stuff you do if you were out of the cage. So, for example... You know, holding a rally and trying to project power, as you've said, it's kind of like being in the cage and like making threats to the making threats to the guards. <laughs> you know, it's not a very yeah. good idea. Um, it, it doesn't make any sense too, because you have there's nothing you can do from within the cage. Yeah, well, That's there, a very well, good analogy. But um, here's the thing, though: like people escape from jail all the time. People escape from cages all the time. Like um, there's a there was a there was an orangutan. From the zoo, um, from the I think it was the Cincinnati Zoo named Ken Allen, and he escaped from his enclosure like six times, and every single time they tried, they made it perfectly, um, you know, escape proof, and he kept he kept finding ways of getting out of the cage, and so my philosophy is you don't um, you don't puff up like a turkey and start making threats. Um, 
you know, or you, or you keep being demoralizing or whatever, you try to get the key. And in order to get the key, you have to rely upon the arrogance of your, your captors, and you also have to study. You have to study every single day, and you have to leave yourself completely open to any idea. You know, you, you have to... And you also have to start from the world as it actually is. So you have to be able to accept facts that are extremely hard. And, but if you can do that, it puts you in a position of escape. It puts you in a position where you can actually make real change um, you know, by, by exploiting little weaknesses that, that you discover along the way. I think you made two really important points there. And the first uh, is that that turkey analogy is kind of perfect because like when you see an animal puff itself up to look bigger, the reason is that it's trying to uh, communicate to whatever like predator there is that trying to like kill and eat that animal is going to be costly. And so the thing is, if you can't actually follow up on that threat and be costly, to yeah. be like Eden. I mean, it's actually really bad to like puff yourself yeah. up because it makes it even worse. Yeah, run away. <laughs> exactly, right? Like, and then the other thing you mentioned is the idea that you're waiting for like not the arrogance of like the other side and you're waiting for like a, an opportunity. I think there's actually a lot of opportunities that are always presenting themselves for like a. Um, a sufficiently organized political organization to make a difference. Like, for example, uh, like if you remember, like the coronavirus stuff, mm -hmm. there are so many opportunities. Like, I, there's almost too many to list them all off. And 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 this, yeah, uh, there's almost too many uh, different ones. So that I uh, there's almost too many different ones that I could list off. Or, for example, like recently with like the October 7th stuff, we've really seen Israel's um, political capital and like um, moral kind of like quote unquote high ground that they had just completely collapse. And the whole, yeah. uh, they've, they've lost the public relations war. And it really pains me that there's no organized group that can take advantage of that. Because right now it'd be such a great opportunity, I feel to sort of on the propaganda front strike back against them and really like spread the word. Yeah, I mean I think that regardless of the fact um regardless of the fact we don't have anything organized now, I think it's just they were just given a gift. I mean, you know, the Jewish people have always been perceived as victims and now it's kind of like we have this thing we can just shove in their face to shut them down, make them, you know, rage. <laughs> And that's kind of what I've been doing on Twitter is whenever I see some, like, um, Israeli shill going on about white people or whatever, I always say, uh, stop killing children. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you like, know, uh, it works. This, uh, like, exactly, exactly, like, it, it just works now. It's, it's, it's like we have our own Holocaust, except ours is, like, actually real and happening right now. You yeah. know what I mean? And it's great for dismantling their, like, made-up one. Mm -hmm. Like... It's, it's, as I said, it's such a good, like, opportunity, but because there's no organization to take advantage of that, like, I, to some extent, um, I think that's a major disadvantage of a lot of the decentralization strategies that a lot of different groups um, support. I think the reason that a lot of people on the right support heavy decentralization is that uh, fundamentally it's scary to have, like, an organized group because that creates a central point that can be attacked as opposed to a decentralized group, which is more difficult to like um, attack. However, it's a lot more difficult for a decentralized group to actually do like um, meaningful action. I think that's the trade-off there. Yeah, I, I agree with that. I think, um, I think the centralized actors, I think those are going to be people that are, you know, just much more bold and, and willing to take risk and might be, might be even a little bit foolish. Um, you know, like uh, I can, I can, I can kind of see that, like more of like the normie con organizations becoming more radical, and then like kind of doing stuff in our in our interest. Yeah, actually, it's interesting. Have you because for like the the like mainstream or more mainstream like kind of right wing figures, like like uh, like that lady, like Candace Owens, yeah, for example, they can't go like full like deep throat Israel mode. 
They mm-hmm. can't like they can't take the uncircumcised or the circumcised sausage <laughs> too deep because <laughs> the people that like them are all just like anti-Semitic. Or, yeah. I, or I should say a big chunk of them are anti-Semitic. Of everyone who, of everybody who's not like Ben Shapiro. So like mm-hmm. Candace Owens can't go, she can't get fully behind Israel because what's gonna happen is like 20% of her audience is like they're killing babies. Like what's yeah. wrong with you? Same with like uh, Matt Walsh or like these others. They have to kind of like toe the line a little bit. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I but, think. Um, oh, I was gonna say. I think that's the big place that the uh, alt right or alternative right, distant right, whatever whatever people word people want to use. The new right, the vanguard right. I've heard a lot. I think vanguard right's really good, but uh, I like to call uh, them nationalists. Yeah, the the nationalist right. Like, I think that the nationalist right has actually won a huge victory in terms of making like philo-Semitism like completely verboten on the yeah. inter- at least on the internet, like. And uh, if you remember that leaked ADL call with Jonathan Greenblatt, that's actually something they're very worried about, where essentially they understand that if you're under the age of like 35, like you just hate Israel, you just hate, (laughs) you just like, you just hate Israel. If you're under the age of 35, they're like, Holy shit! The only people we, the only oh, people that no, actually, is, why is that? oh, oh god, goodness. the only people that support us are the sixty-five-year-old Oh my lord! Oh my god! It's like, like they can't, the, like Christian Zionism, for example, is like completely dead. Like no one under the age of like sixty-five no, believes in no. that. Nobody, nobody believes that like the IDF is like the world's most moral army or anything like that. It's just completely, uh, uh, yeah, yeah. It's just completely verboten to support Israel on the internet while being on the right. Interestingly, on the left, I feel like it's become slightly more acceptable. However, for again, like for young people on the left, they also hate Israel because half of them yeah. are like not even like white. <laughs> half of them are less <laughs> white than me. <laughs> you know? Yeah. So um, a- anyways, oh sorry. What uh what I've been really excited about is um this new phase regarding X um or regarding Twitter like you know this has really changed the conversation in a significant way and and I don't I don't I'm not a fan of Elon Musk. I think that he's a a pathological person, but he's really just done, you know, so much for our cause by by making the website kind of uncensored. I mean, it's kind of censored. It's kind of, there's kind of like BS like that. I had one of my accounts uh, deactivated, but I mean, like every comment section, it's just like, it's just our guys just, you know, hammering people and, uh, you know, blowing up and, you know, lots of ratios. Um, I just see the conversation changing in a very positive way. And I think that um, we're kind of winning right now. So. I agree, and and I think that uh, I think that again, it's like a huge opportunity. Like like Twitter is is essentially Twitter is essentially like a free for all. Now, to, to some extent, I think that the re one of the reasons that Twitter is a free for all is that the like level of competency in terms of like the censors and stuff has gone down. Like for example, on Twitter, there's like a huge problem with like spam bots and stuff like oh, that. Oh yeah. Like like the OnlyFans bots and like this all that like yeah. shit. And uh and I think to some extent it's all due to like incompetence. Cause I I really agree with what you said. I, I think Elon Elon Musk is like a very like pathological like pathological person. I think he's definitely Oh yeah, not he's a total liar guy. Like I think he's definitely not our guy, and I I think he's like uh like I think like some element of it must be like narcissism. Um, he's but, some uh, he's some kind of antisocial. I I watched. Yeah. Um, there's a good series you can watch on him by this like uh, by this libtard guy named um, um, oh I forget the name of it. But just look up uh, Elon Musk debunked. And oh yeah, it's the common sense skeptic, and he has like the series just debunking all of Elon Musk's claims. I mean, it's all just like completely ridiculous. Elon Musk is not going to take us to Mars or. You know, build the solar panel houses. You know, all, it's all junk. Yeah, to, 
to my understanding, like his fortune is essentially a mixture of like what he's inherited plus like tax credits from the state of California and like, and just, like subsidies. Yeah. Just scamming redditors basically. <laughs> kind of based. Yeah, I honestly just take all the money out of like Wall Street bets or whatever the fuck it's called. Yeah. <laughs> just uh yeah, I uh I don't know. I, I think it's interesting how, like, on, on the right wing, like, people are, like, very desperate to have, like, some type of, like, personality, like, cult leader in yeah. a way that, like, the left wing, like, doesn't. Mm -hmm. And people, because of that, latch on to, like, very, I think, unhealthy figures like Elon Musk or, like, Donald Trump or, like, whoever else that's, like, someone, and you, who's used, someone else who's using them, like, cynically. Because it's a very, like, cynical thing. Like, I'll, I, I think this is a more of a problem for, like, conservatives than, like, nationalists. But I think that a lot of the people that are, like, thought leaders, kind of movement leaders on the right are significantly more, like, grift-driven yeah. than on the left. Yeah, I, I agree. Because it's it's pretty easy to be, like, a conservative commentator. All you have to do is read the news and complain about it and just, like, point out hypocrisy for like five hours and you're you're done you know? yeah yeah it's a pretty easy job and then you sell uh you sell stickers and hats and all kinds of garbage you sell uh well, diet pills <laughs> yeah you sell you sell like magic algae like diet pills, yeah magic like, magic algae like and like uh like uh like lead paint chips that like destroy negative ions or whatever the fuck. yeah Negative ion bracelets, yeah, negative ion bracelets with like radium in them. I don't know. <laughs> you just give your followers like fucking radiation poisoning. Yeah. It's pretty bad. But uh, yeah, the grift right. I, I think I think that's also a bigger problem about like the schizo right. Like anyone doing like the flat Earth shit or like the like on like more gallons. I don't know. <laughs> the yeah, really like yeah. goofy stuff or like uh, yeah. I don't know. <laughs> Those guys are their own yeah. little world. But, uh, I feel a big, a big, a bigger problem though. I see is uh, people like on our side, like you know the uh, nationalist mm. right. A lot of our thought leaders are just like anti-socials, mm. and the, the big problem with that is that, um, you know, as I've said before, when you're trapped in a cage, you want to rely on the arrogance of your captors. Mm. You know, arrogance is just weakness, and these people. They go to our guys, they go to young, impressionable guys, and they teach them to be pathological people, to act in a pathological way, mm -hmm. you know, to be arrogant and to think you know everything and to think you're an elite, think you're some sort of an aristocrat, right? An aristocrat of the soul. <laughs> I'm, an, I'm, an, I'm, a, I'm an Andrew Tate aristocrat, baby. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Like, uh, yeah, what a, yeah, the way to truly become a nobleman is to do sex trafficking yeah it's like now we just need to like synthesize like uh like andrew tate andrew tateism with like with like adam waffen we can have like uh, uh like a uh, siege inspired siege inspired sex trafficking that's what we need that's that's what's gonna save yeah. the save save the west yeah it's not just um it's not just like the andrew tate like migtow kind of people it's also like like intellectuals, like people that, that mm. are like genuinely really intelligent people, people that are extremely talented. They're also extremely pathological and just completely arrogant and narcissistic. And, you know, I've, I've, you know, kind of had this experience where it sort of rubbed off on me and I would just be this like kind of smug, you know, superior person, like kind of, kind of talking down to people a little bit. Um, you know, and I just see that all the time. I see people just that have like an internet daddy that they can't let go of. They can't like think of that in a critical way because they just love this this guy's content so much and all these these you know really smart things that this person has said. And um, I think people are starting to wake up from that a little bit. But um, you know, I think I just keep see I, I just keep seeing people fall for it over and over and over and over again. It's like everybody like everybody's trying to like be the, the wacky Chad meme, and it's just kind of, you know, it, it's really easy to do that. It's really easy to just act eccentric and, you know, just kind of act like an, like an idiot. I, I think that's a really good point because uh, 
for example, I, I think that's a really good point because, for example, being like a good intellectual or being a good like podcaster, or being a good like um, being a good internet daddy doesn't really make you a good leader necessarily. It's kind of the same thing that we get where we have like a celebrity who's a really good actor or something, and then they're just like a horrible person or just like a complete yeah. like train wreck. But it's like being a good actor doesn't necessarily mean that they're good at like everything else. And I think that's a, that's a problem that we run into in the digital age because the way that a lot of people get followers is by being like a good podcaster or a good entertainer or like a good intellectual. Mm -hmm. But that's not necessarily, that doesn't necessarily make them a good leader. Yeah, and it, kind of attracts, it kind of attracts people that are bad because it's like mm. a lot of those people, you know, have NPD and... They just crave attention, so they'll do anything to get attention, and that that includes, um, you know, transforming themselves into competent people. Mm. You know? And it's it's so you have people that are just really super smart, and they're they're reading, um, you know, all this like interesting data on SciHub, and they're sharing it, and blah 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 blah. They're doing live streams or whatever, but it's just like they're such idiots. Like they're just so, mm. oh my god. I'm just so I'm honestly so sick of it. Like I can't I can't watch any of these like HBD channels anymore. They just they just drive me crazy. Well, eventually it also kind of becomes like a sort of intellectual masturbation because what happens is like you get so stuck in like the theory and so stuck in sort of like uh like th I don't even want to say theory crafting because it's a set as you're a lot of them are just regurgitating the same stuff like ad infinitum like uh, forever. Yeah. Stuff from like and 2017. Exactly. Yeah. It feels like I'm back in like 2015, 2016, getting like like in Gamergate again for some of this stuff. Yeah. yeah. And it just uh it just makes you I, I don't know. It I feel I think it also creates like the sort of like um this ex these extremely like hyper specific like ideologues. Like you like you'll encounter people like online that are like dedicated like Mosleyites. Or like dedicated, <laughs> yeah. like, like I'm a dedicated like Salazarist, or I'm a, I'm a dedicated. I pronounced that. I fucking butchered that. Salazar, I'm a, yeah. I'm a dedicated Salazarist. Yeah. It's like it's like what the fuck is that? Like, not to say anything is wrong with like the Falange or like Mosley. Actually, yeah, I have issues with Salazar, but but like the Falange or like Mosley, there's nothing really wrong with them. But it's kind of like. If you describe yourself as like a hardcore Mosleyite, that it just it just kind of reeks of being like, well, this is kind of like this is like a little bit hyper specific. I even sort of feel that way about myself, like self identifying as like a as like a nap sock or whatever. Where sometimes I'm kind of like, this is a little bit like specific. This is a little bit too specific. Yeah, I think it's the problem of ideology because it's like when you. When you call yourself like like I had like I I recently had an idea for an ideology, but it's like if I go around you know calling myself that, is anybody gonna care? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know, and it's, you know. I and think it's. I don't know. I think it's. Um, I think it made sense more in a time when like people actually had flags and stuff, and they had paramilitaries, mm. and they had their own newspaper. I mean, mm. I don't know. I, I just. I, I just. I like to keep things broad. I think it needs to be shaped. You know, before it can have a name, I think it needs to be shaped by like concrete, real-world actions and institutions, and then also to some degree a lineage of transmission. By which I mean, like, uh, there's like a guy that like comes up with the ideology, and then he starts passing it on to like people below him. And that's after it gets passed on, and it's something that's getting transmitted. Then it can have a name. Otherwise, it's just a, otherwise it's just something some guy created. You know, it's what I an mean? authentic, yeah, exactly. Like it, it's just it's similar to like religions, where like if you have a guy that creates like a religion, and he just names it himself. Well, it just it's just sort of ridiculous. It doesn't it doesn't feel like organic. Yeah, yeah, and um, that's actually a topic that I've been really interested in and in thinking about lately is authenticity, because mm. it's like um, it's kind of like being a white couple that like buys a barrel sink because you want your home to be like rustic or like mm. antique. 
It's like it's it's fake. It's like like you've seen this like you know kitsch vintage stuff, right? Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's I it's really. just it's it's really like you know people talk a lot about minimalism and how bad minimalism is, but nobody talks about like this stuff. I mean, this is just total global homo. Um, like my mom, you know, I love my mom dearly. But her house is full of it, and it drives me crazy. I have like mm. right next to my. Right next to where I'm sitting right now, there's a giant pin sign. It's got um, rusted. It's got like these um, faux rusted like um, braces on it. And it says "Honey Beehive Beekeeping Supplies." These <laughs> honey beeswax. <laughs> it's like a vintage like sign, and it's you know, and uh, it just kind of drives like this kind of stuff drives me crazy because it's like. You want to relive that um, that 1950s, that 1960s, but it's like you, you don't live in that time, so it's very inauthentic. You know, when somebody like um, you know made a, a barrel sink in the past, you know they would just do it out of necessity. They would just completely do it out of necessity. And the authenticity part of it is that it's more it's more like you you accrue memories with it over time. Right, you, it accrues wear, it accrues memories. Um, uh, and so that's kind of... And also, um, it, it kind of goes through natural selection because it's kind of like hmm. whatever it is that you're making uh, becomes perfect through a process of trial and error. So like hmm. an ideology, like a, a religion or an ideology that emerges organically is one that has gone through natural selection first. Hmm. So it's, it's kind of like, it's kind of adapted to that environment. I think I think that uh, in terms of authenticity, and I, I know we've talked about this uh, off the air before, but uh, I, I think that the heart of authenticity can be found in like this uh, Japanese concept called wabi sabi, which is yes, uh, yes. which is about the which is the idea that there's a intangible beauty in age, experience, and imperfection. And like for example, take like a pocket knife, right? Like, let's say you have a pocket knife that was owned by your, like, grandpa, and it gets passed down onto you. Now, odds are you can get the exact same knife on, like, a, on, like uh, eBay or something. Mm -hmm. But there's something very um, special about that knife from your grandpa because it's been used by him and has mm -hmm. a beauty. There's a beauty in the experience of the item. Likewise, like, uh, maybe you have, like, a nice pair of boots that you've had for, like, you know, five, ten years or whatever. And that pair, that pair of boots, it honestly might not be as nice as like a brand new pair that you get, or like a one that you get and then break it in over the course of a few weeks. But to you, those boots have like a sort of beautiful like experience to them that makes them authentic to you. And that authenticity is not something that you can buy in a store. Now, to some degree, maybe you can buy it in a store, like um, like the difference between like a really nice like Rolex versus like a swatch. Uh, yeah. There's like a certain like kind of intangible quality to that Rolex because of how like handmade it is. Mm -hmm. Whereas the swatch is just like stamped together in like a factory. However, if say you have like a swatch that you've worn for like 10 years, there's a certain beauty in that and it's imparted on that item by you using that and the age and experience that develop on that item as like mm -hmm. a quality. Yeah, and um, you know, I, I had heard of that concept, and I also, um, what do you call it? Um, I, was, I was thinking about it in terms of like, um, what kind of authentic action is there to be had on the right? Um, like, what is it about, like, what is it about the right that is authentic? And I came to the conclusion it was the dialectic on the right because of just how intense it is and what a, what a history it has. I mean, this is this has gone, you know, this dialectic has gone through so many different eras and phases and movements, and um, you know, it's just got so much lore to it. It's such a it's such a rich and um, authentic process, and so. What I'm kind of uh, arguing is that we kind of have to lean into that um, and try to find a more systematic way of doing it. And that's kind of where Geed comes in. 
I think that's interesting because I I think that a lot of the that's one of the reasons that we tend to just reuse a lot of the same symbols and names because in those reused symbols and names there carries a certain level of authenticity compared to something that was just like made up out of thin air mm -hmm. and in my opinion like in in order to get new symbols and uh, names and stuff like that uh, and really a name is just a symbol in order to get new so i should just say new symbols in order to get those there has to be a uh, real like event that causes the genesis of those symbols. So, yeah. like for example, like um, uh, actually, it's difficult to think of an example for this the cross because they're oh uh, yeah yeah oh okay actually yeah for example like the cross used by like Christians, uh, like that was that symbol didn't just they didn't just like make it up. It came from like an event, yeah. and uh for them the defining event of christianity which is like the crucifixion and the, the mm -hmm. resurrection and then of course like jesus telling his followers that they have to bear their own cross and everything like that there's a lot of like rich like symbology to it or like the chi ro uh or like other like christian symbols they're generally speaking they're never just like made up they're always uh and when you look at one that is made up like the darwin fish or whatever i'm pretty sure that one's made yeah. up it just becomes like ridiculous like yeah. compare like the cross or the chiro chira i can't pronounce it i'm not a, i wasn't raised as a christian i don't have a lot of experience of christianity so forgive me if i like screw some of this up but um like compare those symbols to like the darwin fish and it's like it's obvious which yeah. ones are like more animating right? yeah yeah like um so i think for the right wing to get new symbols because that's something that people talk about it's like well we need to move past this we need to like move past like the swastika we need to move past like the ss runes or like like the the elder like futhark runes and like we need to move past all that well it's like okay i'm i'm totally on board like let's have some new symbols but we have to earn those symbols we have to yeah. earn those um we have to earn, <coughs> we have to earn those new ideas new like idea new ideological monikers and the only way and and those uh new um symbols are going to have a lineage of transmission from the previous ones they're not going to just appear in a vacuum there's generally speaking nothing really tangible that's like that where it just generates just where you just like uh pull it up out of thin air um yeah i think you can only i i think you can only get lucky like i think um i think what happens is that like the symbols that work they just sort of work and they pass on um and but I, but you know so it might be like kind of a case of like um survivorship bias because think about all the uh, symbols that were invented that nobody talks about like nobody they were all just forgotten probably like sitting in someone's drawer somewhere I mean, like, think about um, Carl Otto Pytel and his symbol for, um, you know, national Bolshevism. Like, that's, it didn't really go anywhere, right? Um, you know, like, I know Hitler, Hitler's symbol, um, you know, the swastika, he personally designed that. And that was, like, kind of a reaction to, you know, the design style of, like, the, uh, the communists. And so he wanted like a he wanted like a symbol to react against that, and you know he he was just in the right place at the right time, and it just sort of worked out. So, um, yeah, like, but I think that um, I think what um, how you kind of like get authenticity or authentic action is you just sort of look at like what's already like you know been done already, like what's actually already worked, what has a history, you know, what's mm. Lindy. Mm. And you sort of lean into that. It's kind of like um you know do you know what a two B two T is? Ah uh, yes. It's a Minecraft yeah. server. It's an anarchy Minecraft server. And what's so fascinating about two B two T, this is where I got a lot of my ideas, by the way, um, was uh there's like a, a phenomenon around it, around the history of this server. And there's there's people that that archive all the history like they're kind of like little historians and they have their own wikis and they have um youtube documentaries going over like different like lore between different griefers and fract factions and 
blah, 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 blah. And I thought that was so fascinating. There's sort of like this sense of community or authenticity to this server that I don't find anywhere else. And I think it's just because of just how long it's existed. And so things have just sort of, um, you know, worked themselves out through, through trial and error to where it's, it's kind of, um, I don't know, I, I'm, I have trouble describing this, but um, it's, it's very Lindy because it's a very old server. And, um, you know, I don't know your thoughts. No, I, I totally agree. There's like a history that develops and it's, it's emergent. Like, uh, like I used, like, for example, I, I think a lot of people, um, can relate to this experience, but like, if you have like a closely knit, like group of friends that like gets together often to like, I don't know, like even on like discord or like in real life or, you know, on like back in the day, like mumble or team speak or something or Skype and yeah. you play like video games or do like all this other like stuff together. And you develop a sort of like internal culture, like an inter like an internal, like lingo internal, like um, symbols and that, um, and that's very authentic. It's mm -hmm. extremely or extraordinarily authentic in my opinion. Like um, I think that's interesting because people, I think people really want that. And very few things in the, at least in the modern era, uh, in our general lives, can provide that. I think that's why you see a lot of people retreating out of spaces like um, Twitter, YouTube, Facebook, etc., into like closed private communities like Discord. Like it's not yeah. just the bots and like spam and like dead internet and all sorts of stuff like that i think it's also the desire to have like an authentic community and an authentic subculture yeah that isn't yeah. affected by like spam bots or like uh you know mark zuckerberg or <laughs> some other person mark fuckersberg like yeah. like it's something something that you and your buddies are able to create by yourselves, truly authentically and emergently, Sp or I should say spontaneously. Mm -hmm. Not, um, yeah, uh, I, and I, I think um, and it's almost a shame that so many of these get eventually just get like lost to time because it, it would just be so interesting to catalog these subcultures that develop because they yeah. they actually get very like diverse, very um, very like deep very complex mm -hmm. um and i think to some degree like uh for the right wing to get those symbols about waging a political struggle i think we can do it we can get new symbols um by creating these very robust very uh i don't want to say complicated but very co or I, I should say it very robust very complex very socially um socially uh deep <laughs> i guess that's the right word he's very like deep and complex communities that... i'd say adjusted like socially mm -hmm. adjusted in the sense that like all of the interactions have kind of worked themselves out through natural selection mm -hmm. so like um you, you kind of like you know you talk to you talk to people that make you feel good as opposed to the people that make you feel bad etc so you did there's more synergy, I guess, between you and different members of the community. There's also uh -huh. um, there's also a psychological phenomenon that um, Sam Vaknin brought up in in his book, uh, Malignant Self Love. There was a there was some sort of study where um, uh, some like uh, psych students or something like they were given like um, a lemon, to take home with them, and just sort of like study and just like kind of hang out with. And then they were they were asked to put all these these lemons in a bowl, and then they were just, they were supposed to like pick out their lemon. They were all able to do it. And so the so what Vaknin um, started started talking about was like, is what we call love simply familiarity with something, right? Spending enough time with it. And I think that's that's part of. Um, I think that's part of the equation when it comes to authenticity. It's like the amount, mm. literally the amount of time and the amount of experiences that um, you spend with something. I agree. And there, I think there's also like a, a, 
a way that those experiences transmit from one person to another person as communicated through that symbol. Like, um, yeah. for example, you have like uh, in a friend group that I used to be part of, we had like this symbol that meant a lot to one guy in the group. And what he introduced the symbol to us and like kind of made it the symbol of our group, it actually become, became very authentic almost immediately because there was, even if it didn't mean exactly the same to the rest of us, because the group was already authentic. So anything produced by a member of the group for the group had an intangible, inherent authenticity to it. Yeah, yeah. And um, I guess with Geed, what I want to do is, is try to accumulate some sort of like authentic thing. And um, I kind of see that already happening. Like I see it a little bit, but you know, when we work on the site, it's, it's in, in, in kind of like bursts or flashes, mm -hmm. um, you know, where like we'll, po we'll post a whole bunch of stuff within a few weeks and we'll forget about it for a few months and then we'll come back to it. And, mm -hmm. um, I still have to like fix up the site and do all sorts of HTML and stuff. But um, for mm. those who don't know, Geed is basically it's an experimental site where it's kind of like a cross between Twitter and Substack and kind of like a blog where like um, you submit really short entries that are like uh, about original ideas. Basically, you, you, you submit original thoughts in a very condensed format. And the format is actually, I actually created a format that's called Laconic One. Um, and it's got all sorts of guidelines and stuff, but um, it, it makes it really easy to read. And, and so you can communicate like a lot of ideas in a very, you know, in a, a very dense format. I actually, even, I actually even like the name Geed because it, it feels very, uh, I, I'm overusing the word authentic, so I'm going to say it feels very, very unique. It feels like something organic. you've read. Yeah, it's, it's like organic. Yeah. Like, Geed, um, the, the, the name Geed, it, it kind of rolled off the tongue. That's actually a mispronunciation of Bill Gates' last name because everybody is, you know, mispronouncing his name as Geed or Gade <laughs> or, uh, or whatever. <laughs> so I, I was like, all right. Geed sounds, Geed sounds like the name of a magazine. It kind of reminds me of like, some of those magazines my aunt used to have, like they have weird, like um, like Mugen, like if like there was some magazine named Mugen, um, you know stuff like that. Hi, right. what I what I think kind of adds to the authenticity too, is that it's being like contributed to by like a bunch of different people, and like that kind of like multi multipolar sort of like um, like effect that happens causes it just ca it causes it, it just causes it to feel more organic uh because it feels like it's it's more of like a community effort which which i like yeah but um it's gonna take a long time to to get this going what i what i plan on doing is um building an audience off of video essays mm -hmm. and then like using that audience to kind of like you know make these projects come to life because i remember i had a forum or um, my group called World, World College of Life. Um, by the way, I, 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 my mouth is like really dry or something. I can't really speak well tonight. Uh, no but, worries, um, I had this, I had this, uh, I had this forum. It was called World College of Life. I would, I spent money on it, um, like ten dollars a month. It was a, uh, it was based off of discourse, but nobody would use it because I was running around trying to get people to join it, and it just, hmm. it wasn't very authentic, like. But it was funny, though, because after I had tried so hard for, like, you know, a year or two years of trying to get people to use the site, um, when I shut down the site, there were people that, like, really liked it, and they, they wanted to know where it went. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, yeah, so that's how I met some of my friends, um, mm -hmm. you know, so. I feel like this is the only time I'm ever going to recommend it, but I feel like Discord is actually, like, a decent starting off point for oh, I... creating like alternative things because it's kind of low cost and you can just like bring people like into it and then things can kind of form organically by people just talking with each other yeah 
And uh, another big thing with, with regards to um, creating something organic, you do kind of have, if you, if you want to make something that becomes organic, you have to be persistent. You have to, mm. like, consistently get people in there and until, like, there's enough people to where it can kind of grow on its own. Um, yeah, it's, that, that's the hardest point part, too, because it's, it's, like, going from, like, that zero to one is... I find that's the most difficult. Like, I, I have, like, really a project hard. that I'm working on. Um, actually, funnily enough, on Discord, and I'm finding, like... Getting it off the ground is like the hardest, uh, hardest thing. Um, and uh, but I feel like once it gets to that point where it's organic and people are just like talking to each other spontaneously and bringing new people in spontaneously, I feel like that's where like the magic happens. Like that's I just find that very like authentically beautiful. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, and um, I'm very optimistic. I mean, like I think that you know. Kind of like the stuff that I've been involved with, like rational science. Like it's it's gotten me to think about topics a lot deeper than I than I would have had the confidence to think about them before. So like, um, you know, like uh, like what we're talking about here, I would not have had the the confidence to really talk about that. But um, that also like homosexuality. Like I basically right. I figured out that homosexuality doesn't exist. There's no such thing as a homosexuality. Um. I'm actually working on a video essay about that. Ah. But um, uh, I feel like um, we're kind of like on the verge of, of a renaissance, honestly, of a, of a whole host of new ideologies and ideas that, that have never been thought up before. Because I, I think that um, that's sort of the direction that we're moving in. Especially because I, and I'm really curious to hear your thoughts on this. I feel like we are entering into like a new industrial revolution. One that is, um, one that is where essentially people have like a mass proliferation of labor saving technologies. Like for example, these like generative GA, GANs, generative artificial network, yeah. networks, whatever the AI, whatever the fuck people want to call it. But we have this, incredible labor saving technology and all these other incredible labor saving technologies too from the past and that are also being developed now and they're causing people to radically rethink the way we um structure our uh, economies i think actually speaking of like 20th century stuff that i think is worth revisiting i find myself thinking a lot about uh like technocracy and uh, to be honest, I haven't actually looked a lot into it, but I remember reading about it. And basically it's this like pseudo socialistic idea where um, the whole like economy is centrally planned in such a way to, to like utilize labor as much as possible to have the highest like level of efficiency. So for example, everyone's organized into like a different um, team and um, that like team cohort works during different parts of the day or different uh, days of the week. And they're staggered such that everyone I think has like three or four days off, but there's also work being done seven days a week. So production like never stops. And I, I think um, I think something similar would be very possible uh, because of because we have so much uh, like human capital and these incredible like labor saving technologies it seems almost like ridiculous not to update the way that we run our economy in a way that keeps like higher levels of employment for everybody yeah i mean um i have a a, a different view of technology i recommend the book shock of the old by david edgerton mm. um basically what his point is if i could if i could summarize it from perspective of rational science the basic idea is that technology is just a bunch of objects moving around mm. so it's really complicated it's mm. like it's it's you know people um what, what edgerton points out repeatedly in the book is that people always tell stories about technology they don't really establish them with data or evidence i mm. mean even ted kaczynski does this except mm. he just sort of like inverts the hype so he'll like look at you know, a few inventions like uh, gene editing or something like that. He'll go, "Oh, this is the age of gene editing." Mm. It's like, okay, well, what is, where has gene editing actually been used, and what, you know, what is the actual like economic mm. 
potential of this technology? Where is it actually going to be mm. used? Um, you know, um, people just sort of like, like the, like the concept of a fourth industrial revolution. That's actually mm. something from the 1940s. Um, uh. People have been people have been saying this for for a very long time. Um, you know, uh, but I I personally think that we're kind of at the end of technology. Like mm. I think that um, there isn't a whole lot more that we can invent or will invent. Mm. Um, I think that once you invent the smartphone, it's kind of that's kind of it because it's like. You know, it's just, it's a rectangle that does everything, you know, it's like, uh, mm. and I've seen, I've seen like those, those proposed alternatives, like, um, the internet of things or the, what is it that like little pin that like, it has like a projector, <laughs> you know, like that, that kind of thing, you know, most, uh, pretty much all, all new inventions nowadays are just combinations of older inventions, mm. you know, and, and the problem is that when you, when you combine inventions together, you know, you make more complicated inventions. Like it, it, mm. it relies on more complicated um, networks of manufacturing. And so, mm. when you think about like an AI technocracy, it's really a stage of civilization. And mm. it's a, it's the same problem with socialism: is that as a stage of civilization, you know, it, it's okay if like the system works on paper, if as long as it works on paper. It can work. Like anarchism can work, communism can work, as long as it works on paper. The problem is the content of the system. So, if you have if you have like black Africans, and you and you teach them how to do Marxism, they're gonna fucking fail because they're Africans. But if you um, you know, um, if you give it to like Japanese people or something, or, or you know, Koreans mm. or, or Chinese people, whatever. You know, they'll actually, like, make something, you know, whereas, like, um, you know, you, you, maybe you try socialism in Israel or, or the West, and it just doesn't really work. Mm -hmm. So I think that, uh, you know, an AI technocracy, it's dependent on eugenics, and it's also, um, it's also dependent on very precarious method, um, modes of production. Mm -hmm. Yeah, my my view on technology, uh, and and also, um, like for example, like whether like a system works like logically, I don't necessarily think that means it would work in real life. Uh, my view generally is that logic is a human is like <laughs> a social construct. It's a tool mm -hmm. created to describe the world, but it doesn't really inherently have truth or reality to it. And as such, it's I possible see. for something to be logically correct or internally logically correct, but not actually practical in the real world. And mm -hmm. uh, anyways, my, my view of technology, and uh, you guys can, I'm just going to pimp this real quick, you guys can uh, read more about my views on technology, which are definitely stated better than I'm about to state it, on the Geed blog <laughs> under uh, T yeah, Butters. Yeah. But my view of technology is that fundamentally, technology is just an extension of the human body. Uh, and my opinion is that uh, I take the position of... Um, mental monism or not mental non-dualism which is that the brain and the body are inseparable the mind and the body are inseparable um and so generally uh, i'd see i see technology as just being like an extension of the human itself and therefore not inherently good or evil and generally speaking usually good uh the question is how it's used and how it um how it interfaces with the human brain and body uh, or I should say the human body period. Um, and so, for example, I think the smartphone and the Internet of Things is extremely interesting because essentially what the smartphone is is it allows you to connect to the Internet from anywhere. And the Internet mm. fundamentally functions as a sort of collective unconsciousness, or I should say collective consciousness because it's not unconscious yeah. at all. Um, and so that collective consciousness lowers your social distance um and that lowered social distance create is in my opinion the reason that there's so many kind of like internet bored like mental illnesses that people get from using like social media because it's like it's like yeah. you have like a little wound and you're like picking at it constantly <laughs> yes, uh, but at yes. the same time it has the power for like truly like incredible things like you could just be walking around you could be like 
I wonder what happened on this day in like 1793. And then you can like go up and go to like the Wikipedia page and, I'm, and go to like 1793 and you can see all the events that happened. And you can be pretty much anywhere where you have like a cellular connection and do that. And so it's very powerful in terms of like augmenting like your knowledge. And likewise, you have like these labor saving technologies. Like for example, uh, in my translation work using AI, uh, I'm able to do like this kind of these kind of like brute force translations from like Chinese to English that would probably take me like months to do and do them in the span of like maybe like 30 minutes. So it's wow. it's very, very powerful, but it's also very dangerous because of the damage that can be done by these technologies. The same way that um like you could you could make you make like a chainsaw and all of a sudden like a lumberjack can be like a big okay maybe not always but a lumberjack can be like a could hypothetically be a big like fat guy who like this is like totally sedentary and just uses a chainsaw and chops a tree down i'm sure it's harder than that i've never done it before uh rather than the past where like a lumberjack has to use like a like an axe and has to eat like a diet yeah. of like forty thousand calories a day to maintain that lifestyle um, but likewise, you could use a chainsaw to like chop to like go like full leather face on somebody. So it's um, it's all about how it, how technology is used. It doesn't really have an inherent goodness or badness because that's just a mm -hmm. concept. Like a physic, like a physical object um, can't really have like an inherent like subjective concept like that embedded within it. In my opinion, mm -hmm. and I believe. We agree on uh, Calhoun's experiment, yeah. right? Yeah, yeah, like um, that. This this was like the animals were basically abusing each other, and that's yeah. why they 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 did it. Because uh, uh, I know Bill Gates argues that it's um, it's mutational load. I know some people uh. argue that, but the problem that I see is that he did an experiment before he did um, the Death Squared one, where like he had a bigger enclosure and it was mm -hmm. in the woods, um, and the behavioral sync did not manifest then. It, it, uh, like, there were some, there were some um, deleterious effects, but it was not as significant as when he had them really compacted together. Uh, um, so I think that's it, it was just sort of um, the animals abused each other. Because I remember I, there's this video uh, that I saw on Twitter. You can go, uh, you can find it on YouTube, but it's basically a video of a bear that it was raised in, in a, a tiny cage for like its entire life. And then it was let out into the wild. And because this bear has been uh, walking around in a circle in its cage for so long, it just does that in the woods. So like, mm. there's like a, a ring where the, uh, the bear has been walking for hours and hours and hours. It's really sad. Jeez. Um, but it shows you that, you know, um, environment does have an effect on, you know, like the, 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 the patterns in your brain, the structure of your brain. So... I think that, um, like for example, the rat experiment. Just to, uh, to circle back real quick before I address that, I think that uh, with like the rat experiment, I I chalk it up to being social distance causes like low social distance causes the mice and any like kind of like living creature to become uh, stressed, and then that stress causes them to behave very antisocially and lash out. My issue with mm -hmm. mutational load is that uh, my my view is that natural selection is a fundamental, or I should say, evolution is fundamentally uh, a natural law that um, will inflict itself even on like a closed system like that. And so, even if there's mutational load, they shouldn't just like die out because of that generally yeah they need there needs to be like an external force that would cause them to die out rather than mutational load because logically it makes sense to me that uh, and i did just say logic was not perfect here but logically it makes sense to me that uh that for like the rats and mice like even if they're having like a higher level of mutational load they should still be able to persist like uh, almost indefinitely because like the bad genes will die out eventually, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, I agree. But uh, I, I think that um, I think social conditioning is actually very important. I think I think that there should be a balance in terms of how we view things between nature and nurture. Like um, 
I think I think conditioning does account for a lot of uh, like, for example, in your work, kind of researching like people with, like NPD. I think a lot of NPD and like other uh, other like disorders stem probably from social conditioning and not and are not like entirely like uh, innate or genetic. Yeah, it's. Uh, I think a lot of it is just like. Um abuse at an early age mm. and that kind of messes up the patterns in your brain and that's kind of permanent mm. um because it's kind of like that bear you know mm. yeah it's like because you only have like a certain like a uh, range of neuroplasticity and so like once something is like deeply embedded it's very difficult to like just change it like naturally yeah i, I mean it could be uh it could be genetic. I I, mm. I just have a I have I have trouble with the uh, the terms and you know genes versus environment because mm. it's like okay well what do you actually mean uh. you, know, you got to be able to define those and you know how I would define it is that if you're talking about genetics you're talking about the object called the gene mm. if you're talking about environment you're talking about anything else that's that's not a gene not an object called a gene what um oh but, but oh, sorry that's a, that's its own discussion I guess yeah my my no, I, I agree. Like, like my view is that when people refer to the gene, like the genetics of it, we're really referring to like the phenotype, which is the expression of the genes. So, mm -hmm. so you're kind of looking at it holistically as like the fe as like the phenotype of like the organism, rather than the uh, which would be the physical structure which is produced by the gene. So, for example, um, uh, let's say like for example. Um, NPD is caused by a specific like uh, it's like a physical brain disorder so that means and let's say it's genetic that means that the phenotype produced by the genotype that the person uh, exp um, like manifest that's manifested in the person physically has the configuration which causes like NPD or whatever other disorder whereas like an environmental like explanation would be that during the development of that person, external forces cause the configuration of that person's brain to arrange itself in a way that causes um, that person to have NPD or like a different uh, like disorder. Yeah, that's usually yeah. how I think about it. And I, I think it really is a disorder, like a brain disorder, because it's like the way that these people act is like cockroaches. Mm. Like they, they, they. It's kind of like if you take a cockroach and you hold it over a flame and it just starts reacting like mm. they are, they react to things automatically. Mm. They lie about things habitually without any clear motive or goal. Mm. You know, it's, 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 it's psychotic in, in the sense of psychosis being like mm. um, something that's just having trouble like discerning reality, right? But it's, it just seems completely like on, um, like, these people are on autopilot, and that's something that Sam Vaknin talks a lot about. I mean, I just don't think there's really, you know, anything going up in their in their heads. They, they just seem like headless chickens. Mm. Yeah, like, there, there's, like, a certain, like, kind of path, like, pathological, it's like a kleptomaniac, where, like, they have these certain, like, disorders. I, I really have, I really feel like BPD is like this, where, like, BPD is, like, a life-destroying, like, uh, illness, at least from, like, from what I've seen, like a lot of people with like BPD just go like fucking, like just like lose it. Like I have a I have a buddy who's like a uh, mom has BPD and her life is just like like destroyed because every time she has something good going for her, the BPD flares up and she just compulsively has to like self destruct. And I mm. think I think there's a lot of like uh, that's why mental illness is so scary because it strips you of your agency because mm -hmm. um i think that uh generally just like as like a human being i have a lot of i think a lot of people myself included have uh derive a lot of comfort from having agency so mm -hmm. like when you're in a situation you're always able to choose your actions but mental illness strips your ability to do that um yeah yeah and I, I think any type of dis, any type of like a mental condition where it strips your agency like completely in the way that like NPD or like severe like bipolar and stuff like that do, 
I think that that's when it really is like a disorder compared to like something where it's like a different like neurotype. Wait, bipolar or borderline? Uh, like both both of them, I think, do the, are oh, like okay. that, right? I don't know much about more. Uh, I don't know much about bipolar. I um I know quite a bit about um, borderline. Like mm-hmm. I, I have lots of people in my uh, family that are borderline. Mm-hmm. Um, I also believe that I have like some borderline traits. Mm-hmm. So, but um, yeah. I mean, bo- I mean, borderline's really awful. Oh mm-hmm. god. Yeah, I am. Uh, like I, I guess I guess we're talking about like stuff like that. I feel like I have like a high level of like neuroticism personally. <laughs> but I'm not sure if it's like if it's good to like be talking about this uh, on the air. But yeah, I feel like I have like a high level of like neuroticism, and so um, and it definitely it definitely does not definitely does not really it's not very helpful. Yeah. 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 Yeah, and um. But there's not really a whole lot of help for mental illness. I mean, I, I was in a mental hospital like last year and you go in there and it's like they offer you drugs and then they offer you like um, just Google uh, DBT um, wise mind. Mm-hmm. It's the most ridiculous stuff you'll ever read. It's just, it's just like kindergarten stuff and they have you, you go through like a six month um, or six week program. It's just like a Venn diagram of like platitudes. Oh yeah, this shit seems like ridiculous. I'm just looking this up right now. <laughs> yeah, you have you have uh, and that's what's so silly about that's what's so silly about uh, restorative justice or rehabilitative justice. It's like that's what that's what's available for you when you're when you go to kill yourself. That's what you have waiting for you when you go to kill yourself. Um, when I was in the hospital. I met this lady, she had like OCD or something, and she was so desperate for help that she was going to get experimental brain surgery where they were going to sever some of the nerves in her brain. So it's kind of like a lobotomy, Ugh. you know, and it's, Jesus. you know, and that's, that's, um, that's why I'm like really big into rational science or, or part of the reason why I'm big into it is that I think that I can lay some foundations for psychology. I, I think from, that, from a physical point of view, hmm. I think that like men, like treating like mental health is it's like one of the things that like modern medicine has just not been able to like create a compelling theorem for how to do that. Like from what I understand, a lot of like psychiatry, for example, is built off the idea that mental illnesses are caused by chemical imbalances like within your brain. And so they're they try to treat it by treating like chemical like hormonal imbalances and like uh like like other types of imbalances, and I I think that's probably just not correct because it, it just doesn't seem to work. Like so, for I some stuff, partially it seems to correct. Happen. Mm. I think it's I think it's partially in the correct in the sense that like um, when we talk about chemicals, like I also would include like. Um, like the atoms in your brain, mm. like basically anything that that regards the physical structure of your brain, that's like one kind of illness that you can have. Like, mm. and I would, I would, I believe um, NPD might be one of those. Like, mm. your brain, your brain is just literally structured in a weird way. Mm. Um, whereas other kinds of disorders, I think they're just um, caused by irrational thinking. Uh. Um, so, like, um, or also just like not really understanding yourself. So, for example. Um, like anxiety, uh, a lot of people think that anxiety sort of comes from nowhere. I I personally believe that anxiety is when your subconscious just kind of recognizes a threat, uh. but consciously you can't tell what it is, so you're kind of confused. And so that's why that's how like for example, novelist John Gardner knew that he was going to die before he got on his motorcycle and did so. About a week mm. before he he went on his motorcycle, you know, he was kind of drunk and killed, got killed. He he told people that he thought he was going to die, and you know, you have to explain that. That's very spooky. I think that's just because his subconscious kind of put two and two together that this guy was drinking all the time. He was playing, uh, riding on a motorcycle. Um, you know that something really bad was going to happen to him. Mm. So, you know. Um, 
I think that uh, anxiety, I, that's my personal opinion, anxiety is caused by something. I, so I, oh, what you would do to treat, what you would actually do to treat anxiety is to just like figure out what those things might be and then like fix them. I, I really strongly agree with you because I've had that, not, not like thinking I was going to die, but I've had that experience before where I've had like these various like issues in my life and, or issues in like certain things I'm doing. And once I was able to identify them as the um, source of the anxiety and then handle those problems, the anxiety related to those things like went away and the overall level of anxiety that I was feeling like went away. Um, what are your, what are your thoughts on like, um, like for example, uh, gee, this is like an anecdote. I want to know your thoughts on like this anecdote that I have. Like when I was in college, uh, I had this professor who told me that I remember I was talking to the professor and I said to him, I had this like nightmare about like, um, there's like, I was that there's like a whole like class that I signed up for that I forgot to, uh, uh, do. And now I had to do like the final form like day of. And I was had like an F, like was like my average grade. And the like the professor laughs. And he's like, I haven't like taken a class in like twenty years, and I still get that nightmare. Like, what are what are your <laughs> like what are your like thoughts on like stuff like that, where it's like a recurring like almost like a recurring trauma that just like happens. I think um, I think that's probably you know when you think about like um, dreams, a common thing that people say about them is that it has something to do with like calibrating. Um, your reaction to like threats, mm. and I think that you know, you know, things that stress you out are going to be coded as threats, so they'll sh they'll show up in your dreams. So, for example, um, there is someone who I won't name who brings me a lot of stress mm. because he's basically like some sicko, like mm. pedophile, and I I have dreams about him a lot, you know, and mm. he doesn't necessarily attack me. I mean. Sometimes he does, but, um, you know, I, it keeps putting me in this, like, social interaction with him. And it's just, it's, it's because of, like, the stress that that person causes me. Um, but but uh, dreams, they, uh, dreams, they either have something to do with, like, a threat, you know, running away from something, or sex. Mm -hmm. or, like, wet dreams, and then, like, threats, basically. I don't mm -hmm. think that there's really... I don't really know if there are other dreams that are like different from that. I think they're all they all have something to do with running away from something, even if it's like not a nightmare, even mm. if it's not necessarily a scary nightmare. But like it, it has to do with like um, you know finding something or getting away from something. Mm. You know, um, I don't know. I, I I have to think more about. It. I actually. Um, even though I'm really big in a psychology, I have thought so little about dreams. I, I just think it, you know, everybody, all these psych, psychotherapists, um, psycho Freudian types, like they love to, they love to talk about dreams. They love to analyze them. I, I find them to be not interesting. Yeah. My, my thing of dreams is that generally, I think there's a lot, a lot of time as subjective meaning that can be found, but it, it doesn't. I think generally it's not really scientific. I think it's something that you like whether a dream has like meaning to you, at least in like in my personal life, I find I find it like intuitive. Like like I can usually intuit whether a dream was like important and whether I should like try and recall it and like pay attention to it and like think about it, versus whether or not it was just like gibberish mm -hmm. or just like just like a random dream. No, um, I recently have uh, come up with a term for um, a psychological concept that interests me, um, and I call it force of recording. Mm. So force of recording, it's, um, it's actually just a technique for, um, I developed it to like, help myself learn how to draw. Mm. And so the idea of force of recording is, it's like, okay, well, you know, what's the most efficient way to learn a subject? Um, you know, and um, in this case, drawing. Well, first off, you're going to have to, like, um, break it down, like, point by point, like, memorizing stuff. like It's, like, really simple, you know, um, because, like, rote learning is, like, you're not actually, like, learning anything. And the problem with rote learning is that it's, like, um, the stuff that you actually do learn after 
thousands of, of passes of trial and error. That stuff kind of um, gets erased by the mind, by um, knowledge decay. Because, like, there's only a... From my point of view, you know, thought is physical. So, like, your brain has to, like... Your brain has a, a limited amount of space. So it has to, like, actually just wipe out things that it cannot fit in there. Um, so so that's, that's sort of why I reject l rote learning. And that's why I, I prefer meaningful learning. Because, you know... You'll you'll never forget the time mm. that like you you cut your chin open, or were were in the hospital, or you know had sex for the first time, right? Mm. You'll never forget that. You don't have to like do rote learning, like doing the same thing over and over and over again to remember that. So that's why I liked um, that style of mnemonics. Mm. Um, now, the idea of force of recording is that it's like okay, well. How do you fight knowledge decay? Um, well, you have to remember that the brain is going to store memories that it considers to be important. So it's like, okay, well, what is, um, how does the brain determine if a memory is important or not? And I came to the conclusion it's either highly unexpected events um, or highly emotional events, you know, or, or one or the other or both. And so the idea of force of recording is you take like a simple point, for example, you memorize like a certain proportion of a, you know, piece of anatomy, like, a, you know, the, 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 the stature of a person is eight heads tall, like that, that simple fact. You associate that with something that's highly unexpected or emotional. This could be like you drink something that's like some weird Asian soda or something, or you, mm. I don't know, you, you burn your hand in soup, <laughs> you know, like self-abuse. <laughs> So it could it could be a bit, um, I don't know, unhealthy to do this. Uh, like, you know, you you could use self abuse to remember <laughs> that thing permanently. <laughs> I <laughs> eat dirt or cricket or something. I, I don't want to. I haven't tried that yet. But all delicious cricket, my favorite. <laughs> but um, but uh, I actually I think there's I think you're spot on with that. Because I, I recently heard of this technique that people use to like memorize stuff, and uh, particularly I think it's like college students like studying. Uh, I heard about this on like fucking TikTok. So forgive me if this is like if I'm totally full of it right now. But supposedly, like if if you're like recall like memorizing something, if you have like a specific smell that you associate with that memory, you can instantly recall it by reproducing like that smell or other physical phenomenon. And also by doing that, like association, it makes the memory much stronger. Yeah, and yeah. so I, I think there's a lot of truth to that, where the strength of a memory is very much connected to like physical sensations that happen to you when you're like memorizing it. Like, um, is and I think that's one of the reasons why uh, doing something is the best way to remember to like remember it rather than hearing it. Mm -hmm. Or hearing, like, like for example, like, you hear, like, a story, and the story really, like, impacts you, like, emotionally. Uh, or even, like, a movie. Like, a movie really impacts you emotionally. And that can be with you, like, for the whole rest of your life, you know? But, mm -hmm. like, I can't remember, like, you know, like, the episodes of, like, some random show that didn't have any impact on me. Um, I remember hearing, uh, like, a piece of advice that was... Like, if you're talking to someone and you want them to, like, like you, especially, like, a girl or something, you want to leave some type of impression on them. Even, like, a negative, like, emotion is better than, like, nothing. Like, even mm -hmm. if, you can't if you can't make them feel good, make them feel, like, something, like, negative. Because it's better mm -hmm. to feel something than to feel nothing, because if they can feel anything at all, then they'll remember you. Yeah. And, um... What do you call it? Um, there's a there's another thing I noticed when I was doing this, um, because I was thinking about like, what do I actually remember when I do X, Y, or Z? And I realized that uh, my brain was actually kind of like simplifying what I remembered. Mm. Like, um, it would try like, it would it would take the the item that's like not important or not emotional or, or unexpected, and it would try to um, get rid of it, like, or, or separate it somehow. Mm. And I, I call this artifacting. Mm. So, like, um, like, say that you, say that, like, years ago, you, um, 
you had you were in a, like a really bad accident and you went to the hospital. You know, you go years forwards, you still remember that, but you remember a much simpler version of it. Mm. Like you only remember like certain snapshots of that hospital. Everything else is just cut out and and compressed. Um, and like I and that's 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 what I um, I'm being literal like like. Kind of like in the same way that an image compresses. I think it's literally the same thing. As, like, it literally does the same thing. Hmm. I think that's true, especially for like traumatic memories. There's this uh, book I really like called On Combat by uh, Dave Grossman. And um, in that book, he talks about like people that are in like a super like traumatic situations. Like for example, people that are in like a war, people that get like attacked. They can't remember a lot of things like uh, they can't remember what things like smell like. They can't remember like colors. They oh. can't recall stuff like that because it's just not important to that memory. And I think that's like a hyper like um, specialization of that phenomenon that you just uh, just like discussed, where like the brain like they're like when you have like a memory. The brain just wants to get rid of all the parts that just don't matter. So, and it uh, and it assigns whether something matters, like based off how much of an impact it has on you. Yeah, based on how it makes you feel. So, like, you know, so that's going to be either something that's highly unexpected or or just makes you feel very very strong feelings. So, like, um, you know, and that's why a lot of um, you'll have like a lot of memories that just seem kind of unimportant. Like you'll memorize like uh, the time that you went mm. to a certain store and got some eggs or something mm -hmm. like just because for whatever reason, that thing was like highly unexpected or something or yeah. wasn't coded the right way. Or, or like, um, like maybe the physical sensations that you experience are like very vivid. Like, uh, yeah. Like, uh, like I, I don't smell. know. Yes. Like smell. Like, if you like, go to the mall, when you go to the mall, like the smell of the mall is so weird, right? It's it's very but very pleasant. They actually design. I don't know if you know this, but they actually um, they have companies that design smells that they uh, they put into like the air conditioning or whatever of like different stores in the mall. Mm. So they try to like um, alter the mood that way. Yeah, like. Um... Like, and, and, and when you smell that smell, you like, or I should say, when you recall the memory, the, like, the smell is very vivid. Mm -hmm. Like, um, like, uh, I remember it was like, my dad was what was telling me about how, like, uh, he, when he was a kid, his parents would take him to, like, the tobacconist or something like that, and, mm -hmm. like, they have like soda and so every time he has like the smell of like soda he thinks of like dry like tobacco leaves uh, <laughs> but uh anyways actually i'm really sorry i have to kind of yeah i was going here. to end it here actually but uh, this is really good we should we should do this again <laughs> if, you're, if, if you're willing to have me on again we should definitely do this again sometime sure absolutely uh and assuming the people that listen to this don't think I'm horrible, <laughs> but uh, well, I mean, I I'm kind of like mold bug tonight. I'm just like, um, uh... send it, baby, just send it. That's yeah, a, well, that but, makes um, the most authentic podcast is when you just send it. That's right. So, uh, anyways, have a have a good yeah. night. Have a good night, guys. All right, peace.